Uh, right, hi everyone, my name is Ding Kai. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a research fellow, assistant research fellow at the Institute. Um, I'd like to thank Hiro for organizing the uh, workshop so I can uh, show you some of my work. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a pet project of mine that I've been working on for the past year or so when I find the time to do it. Um, so let's get going. Uh, I'm surprised that nobody showed this figure yet. Um, so <laughs> This is a uh, <laughs> this is a summary of all the uh, known exoplanets that's been discovered so far, updated only uh, two days ago. And the point of this figure is to show that uh, there's a huge diversity in the exoplanet population that we've uh, observed so far. So this is showing uh, exoplanets uh, on horizontal axis is the orbital period of the planet, vertical axis is the mass of the planet, and color is the orbital eccentricity. As you see, this you know, the, uh, the exoplanet population occupies a huge parameter space. There are planets that are close in, uh, planets that are far out, uh, low mass planets, by which I mean a few Earth masses, up to masses of about 10 Jupiter masses. So, as a planet formation theorist, uh, our primary interest is to understand why do you get this huge diversity of exoplanets, right? But to address that question, we need to start from basics and answer um, how does one single planet form? And that's a big question because uh, in the standard core accretion theory of planet formation, uh, we start from micron-sized dust grains, and somehow it builds into well, the Earth is several kilometer, several thousand kilometers in size, right? So this is a very really uh, huge orders of magnitude problem. Um, oh yeah. Uh, so how do we try to understand planet formation? Well, to understand that, we need to look. We need to understand uh, where planets form, and as we've already heard, um, planets form in protoplanetary disks, right? And you've already seen, you know, these images of alma images of protoplanetary disks with dust, uh, with uh, dust rings and dust gaps. So this is a also a, I think an alma observation. Um, so this is the dust distribution. As you can see again rings and gaps. But in this observation, they also have a gas kinematics, and by analyzing the gas kinematics, they can infer the presence or the uh, uh, the likely presence of a planet that causes these uh, velocity kinks, uh, which happens around the gap actually. So this is um, very strong evidence of planet formation, or ongoing planet formation in a young protoplanetary disk, uh, both evidenced by gas kinematics and the continuum in the dust. So. Uh, in a simple picture of planet formation, uh, so this is planet formation on one slide, the standard story is that you first form a protoplanetary disk, uh, which is a mixture of gas and dust. The dust component is only about 1% of the disk mass. Uh, but over time, these, this, these dust, uh, dust grains would settle to the midplane of the disk, so you form a dusty midplane layer. And then the dust grains in the midplane layers uh, start to collide and coagulate and grow. And they can grow with, uh, can grow from sticking from, or they can grow from micro sizes to about millimeter or centimeter sizes just by collision or sticking. Um, and then through some yet to be uh, confirmed mechanism, they grow to uh, planetesimal sizes. So these are kilometer or larger uh, bodies. And these kilometer sized planetesimals can then accrete one another or they can accrete um, smaller grains in, the, in what's called a pebble accretion scenario. And uh, eventually, you form a protoplanet, and that's the that's the simple story. So um, the mechanism I want to focus on this talk is this uh, this mechanism. How do you go from millimeter sized grains to planetesimal sizes? Uh, and in the literature, there are a couple of ideas like the streaming instability or uh, secular gravitational instability. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the streaming instability because this is arguably the sort of uh, leading mechanism, or leading theory for planetesimal formation. This is just a simple uh, numerical simulation of the streaming instability. So the streaming instability is an instability of a mixture of dust and gas that is rotating. So if you initialize a protoplanetary disk simulation and you just have gas and dust, and you give it a small kick, what would happen very quickly is that these small fluctuations would evolve very quickly into uh, large scale or large amplitude density uh, fluctuations. So for example, here I start off with a dust to gas ratio around unity, and then only in a few orbits uh, I can generate, or the streaming instability can generate very high density dust clumps. 
And if you were to include self-gravity in the simulation, these dust clumps would actually uh, collapse into planetesimals. So this is one way of forming uh, planetesimals directly from small grains. Now this is a much more sophisticated simulation just to show you that you know, this mechanism does actually work. So this was a paper um, put out by uh, Li Zixin last year. So he ran uh, pretty sophisticated uh, high-resolution simulations of the streaming instability, including self-gravity. And you can see here that he successfully uh, makes, well, a lot of planetesimals actually. Now, the question I want to focus on is how does this mechanism, how does streaming instability work in a realistic protoplanetary disk? By which I mean, in a real protoplanetary disk, we probably do expect some level of turbulence. So the gas in the disk probably doesn't stay very still. There's probably some at least weak level of turbulence. Um, so the question is, okay, so my, my particles settle to the midplane, forming a, mid, a dense midplane layer. And the idea is that, okay, this midplane layer would then undergo contest formation through the streaming instability. But at the same time, if the disk is turbulent, I have gas motions that's uh, disturbing the disk sort of kicking the particles around. So then the question is whether or not planetesimal formation through the streaming instability can still operate in a turbulent environment. So in order to answer that question, uh, I worked with a student, uh, Chen Kan. Uh, actually, Chen Kan was a summer student from 2017, and he finally published his summer project this year. So for the summer students in the audience, um, please try to publish your, your projects. Um, okay, anyway, so what we did was uh, we had a simple model of uh, streaming instability with turbulence. So the turbulence here is modeled as a simple viscosity. So what he, he did was he went away and calculated analytically the growth rate. How fast does this instability grow as a function of the grain size? So we look at things from, say, submillimeter to centimeter, maybe even meters. Um, and then we also look at it as a function of turbulence strength. So alpha is a parameterized uh, turbulence level. So for protoplanetary disks, we expect alpha to be around 10 to the minus 3 at most. So 10 to the minus 3, maybe 10 to the minus 4, maybe even lower. So what he found was that the streaming instability is very sensitive to turbulence. So if we start from, say, millimeter-sized particles, then by the time I consider, by, by, and, sorry, <laughs> if I consider millimeter-sized particles, then for an alpha value of 10 to the minus 3, I already get a very, very small growth rate. So the instability is suppressed by a significant amount if I consider typical um, turbulent strength and millimeter size particles. So for even smaller size particles, the instability is essentially stabilized and quenched. So it would be very difficult to form planetesimals with even smaller grains in typical um, protoplanetary disk turbulent, uh, turbulence levels. Uh, so this is a plot of applying our analytic theory to a sort of physical model of a protoplanetary disk. Uh, so in the red here, I'm plotting the, or he's plotted the growth time scale of the streaming instability in years as a function of radius. Um, and as you can see here, oh, in the black curve is the drift time scale of the particle. So if you drop a particle in a protoplanetary disk, it would actually drift towards the star in some finite time. So Inside here, um, the drift time scales are short, so you would actually lose all your solid particles before it grows to the instant moon. But at large radii, at like, for example, 100, 100 uh, astronomical units, uh, the instability can grow pretty fast uh, compared to the drift time scale and also the uh, lifetime of the disk. Lifetime of the protoplanetary disk is a few million years, so that's the uh, uh, limit of the axis here. And so this is another paper that came out uh, earlier this year. So again, looking at the streaming instability, but now you're doing numerical simulations and driving turbulence by hand in the simulations. So as you can see here, they, they consider two cases. Uh, one is a simulation with weak turbulence. Uh, as you can see, if you look very closely, you can see these uh, density clumps here. So they do actually form planetesimals if the turbulence is weak. But if they drive the system with strong turbulence, then there's no clump. So this is sort of consistent with our analytic theory, where if you have strong turbulence, um, and it's actually very difficult to form planetesimals through the streaming instability. But I do have to, I do have to say that um, these simulations, and also our analytic theory, 
is based on uh, external turbulence. So if the turbulence is actually due to the streaming instability itself, um, you can get quite different results. Uh, so there was a paper out earlier this year looking at the streaming instability um, in a more, slightly more realistic setting where the turbulence is not driven by hand, but it's actually simulated. And they, can, they find that they can, and sometimes it can actually enhance the instability. So that's a different story. Now, one of the uh, caveats of our analytic model is, with uh, Tsinkan was that in order to make the analysis tractable, we made one major assumption or simplification in the analysis. So this is a typical profile of the ratio between dust to gas density as a function of distance away from the midplane. So because dust settles to the midplane, the midplane usually has the highest dust density and it drops off uh, as a function of height. Um, so in this paper uh, this year, we made the simplification by considering regions very, very close to the midplane of this. So we were just looking at what's happening at z equals zero. And if we make an assumption, the analysis becomes uh, much simpler. Um, but that's not really accurate because disks do have a vertical structure, right? So what I am working on now, uh, actually since, since last year, last October, is to generalize this analysis to account for the full disk structure of the protocollinear disk. So I now account for the entire vertical structure. Um, so this is uh, one, uh, uh, I'm relaxing one assumption, but it's a major assumption and it makes the system much, much more technically challenging. Because what, you happen, what happens is you turn a algebraic problem into a ODE problem. So you now have to solve a a O D E boundary value eigenvalue problem, which is highly technical. Um, I actually got stuck on this problem for about three months, um, and I had to I had to actually go downstairs to the uh, AS math department to ask for help. Uh, that, was my, <laughs> that was my first time going downstairs talking to them, um, and it was really fruitful because even though um, the person I spoke to he didn't solve my problem directly, um, he gave me some ideas, uh, which eventually led to me solving what finding an acceptable solution to this problem. So I think interacting with the mathematics department is something we should definitely uh, explore in the future. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, so I managed to solve this technical problem. Uh, so what I did then, I went and calculated the growth rate of this instability, it's, uh, this panel here. Um, and also shown here is the structure, the visualization of the uh, unstable mode. Um, as a function as a, as a, in real space, but also here in uh, wave number space. So at small wave numbers, instability is very slow. As you go to very, very small and smaller length scales, the instability becomes uh, more rigorous. So it becomes quite, quite unstable, very small length scales. So then what I did was um, I took my analysis, and for each mode, I analyzed the energetics of these unstable modes. And what I found was, surprisingly, uh, that uh, for a lot of parameter space, um, the energy of instability actually comes from vertical shear. So it comes from the fact that the midplane of the disk rotates at a different rate than the, gap, the system above or below the midplane. So there's a vertical shear. And in fluid dynamical systems, whenever you have vertical shear, that's a source of um, free energy. So it's, it may be unstable. It can be tapped through instabilities. Possibly. Um, so that's actually a little bit different than the classic streaming instability that was studied uh, prior to, to this work. So the classic streaming instability is um, driven by the fact that dust and gas move at different speeds. Um, so that does happen at the longer wavelengths, but as I go to smaller length scales, so larger kx, I find that most of my modes are actually dominated by this uh, new source of uh, energy, which hasn't really been explored before, at least in this, this context. Um, so my, most recently, I'm trying to wrap up this, this paper now. Uh, most recently, I've been, I've been trying to include uh, viscosity, um, gas viscosity in the system. And what I found was uh, including viscosity, so that's the black curve here, um, suppresses instability quite significantly, actually. Um, so if the system was inviscid, then the growth rate can, can grow um, uh, well, to quite high values. But with uh, viscosity, it sort of really brings down the uh, growth rate. 
And this is sort of qualitatively consistent with our analytic calculations with Sen Kan earlier this year. We also found that in his um, calculations that if we turn on viscosity, then all the growth rates go down quite dramatically. And this is just a uh, visualization of the mode structure in both a viscous disk, so that's for the corresponding to the plot um, on the previous slide, and also a inviscid calculation. So these two have the same parameters, just in one, in one calculation I switch off the viscosity. And as we expect, the viscosity tends to smear things out, right? So in the viscous calculation, the mode is more elongated, the structure has a longer length scale, but in the inviscid calculation, it's uh, much more localized, and that's sort of consistent with our um, physical intuition. And again, I uh, analyzed the energetics of these, of these modes, of these instabilities, and what I found was a somewhat complicated situation. I'm still trying to analyze the results, but qualitatively speaking, um, at low wave numbers, as long length scales, actually still pretty small, but long, long length scales, I can get something like the classic streaming instability, where the instability is mostly due to the relative drift between dust and gas, on the other extreme, for very small length scales, the instability is driven by vertical shear in the system, and at intermediate uh, length scales, I get a mixed, mixed character um, between the two. Um, that's actually uh, almost the end. So uh, the streaming instability is sort of the leading mechanism for planetesimal formation. Um, but the streaming instability can be very sensitive to turbulence in the system. So if you have turbulence in the system, then it may not work so well. So if you want to have planned formation, then it's probably best to have a not, not very turbulent disk or nearly laminar disk. Um, right now, I'm trying to finish up this paper looking at the streaming instability in stratified disks, that is to account for the full vertical disk structure, uh, which is a technical problem, but uh, quite interesting nonetheless. And that would be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Input to the model is alpha, alpha value, and we actually, I actually looked at uh, very small alpha values, like 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 7. So it's almost laminar. And for particle sizes, I was looking at Stokes numbers of 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3. So maybe millimeter or sub, sub, more likely sub millimeter size particles. So, as you said, so, so the first point to the big brain and is very small dust are left in upper heart. So right. yeah, there will be initially so distribution that's called dust size. Alright, so yeah, so that's an important um, point. Uh, so in each calculation I only consider one dust species. Uh, so I did not consider a particle size distribution. Um, that's important because um, so you know uh, some people have started to consider like streaming instability with multiple particle sizes and they find that um, sometimes, if you consider multiple particle sizes, the instability can be uh, reduced. Actually, that's uh, actually quite a good result. I'm still trying to understand that. Do you think the streaming instability can occur in vortex? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are there, there have certainly been claims of streaming instability happening in vortices, but I don't know whether it's the same thing. As well as what's happening here, because the vortex case, um, the flow structure in the vortex, I guess, is quite different than what we're considering here. But the, I think, in, in broad terms, yeah, I guess something similar could happen because the stream instability ultimately is about um, pressure pumps trapping particles, particles dragging gas to enhance the pump. And since a vortex is sort of by definition a pressure pump, that something similar could happen. I expect. Oh. So actually, kind of my next question I'm kind of is in this turbulence effects. So, so um, so there was this one kind of direct attempt 
with but I wonder if this because turbulence can of course be like yeah, compressive or quite 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 have a lot of or it can have quite a lot of vorticity. So could it have could it make a difference with that? Yeah, so the I thought that as far as the streaming instability is concerned, um, it's essentially incompressible in gas. So you can yeah. treat the gas as an incompressible fluid and you would still you would get like essentially the same results. So compressibility is not very important. Um, I'm more, more thinking about the nature of turbulent flows. I like the, they are kind of, are they like kind of polar and wave wave kind of flow, or is it like a trailing? Uh, uh, probably more like in, in the in the context of protoplanetary did it's probably like swollen because we okay. talk about eddy time scales, eddy yeah, yeah. scales, and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, that's that's probably more more like that. Okay, let's let's start new type again.